worse when it is a family of faith. So let us pray. Heavenly Father, we have once again gathered as your family. We are not always the most functional family. So we ask that by your word again today you would restore us, form us more into the image of Jesus Christ. In whose name we pray. Amen. The text for today comes from Luke chapter 12, starting in verse 49. Jesus says to his disciples, I came to cast fire on the earth, and would that it were already kindled. I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how great is my distress until it is accomplished. Do you think that I have come to give peace on earth? No. I tell you, but rather division. For from now on, in one house, there will be five divided, three against two and two against three. They will be divided father against son and son against father, mother against daughter and daughter against mother, mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law, and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. Again, this is the word of the Lord. So Jesus is just a few chapters away from being crucified at this point, which means that his teaching is becoming a little more urgent, a little more cryptic, and it's making people more uncomfortable. Instead of some nice parables about gardens and sheep, Jesus tells people that they should sell all of their possessions because the judgment of God is coming, and when that happens, they're probably going to lose everything anyway. Might as well get rid of them now. And anyone who is not ready for God's judgment to come and thinks that waiting on God is a waste of their time will be severely punished, he says. So he tells them, be ready. And then in this text this morning, he starts talking about fire and baptism. I came to cast fire on the earth. I wish it were already kindled. I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how great is my distress until it is accomplished. What is Jesus talking about? If you think back to the beginning of the Gospel of Luke, you'll remember that a lot of people were coming out to John the Baptist to be baptized in the wilderness, and people were asking him, hey, are you the Messiah? Are you the one we've been waiting for? And John said, no. He's going to come after me, and when he does, he will not baptize you with water, but with the Holy Spirit and with fire. So that's the baptism with fire that Jesus is talking about. Now, fire is usually a reference to the biblical idea of judgment, which is different than we sometimes think of it. We often just think of sheer punishment. But God's judgment is not just punishment, it's purification. It's not a fire of wrath, it's a fire of refinement that burns away everything bad, everything evil, and leaves only what is pure and righteous and holy. Jesus came to baptize the world with this fire so that everything evil would be consumed and only that which is good remained. And apparently, according to Jesus, he will not only give this baptism of fire, he's also going to receive it. That's why he says, I have a baptism to be baptized with. And of course, he's talking about the cross. God's purifying judgment is not just going to fall on the rest of the world. It's also going to fall upon Jesus when he takes our sin upon himself and nails it to the cross. That's what the prophet Isaiah was talking about when he said this. He was wounded for our transgressions. Jesus is that suffering servant in Isaiah 53. The one that Israel has been waiting for for centuries, and by enduring the baptism of fire on the cross, Jesus is going to make good on the promises of God that everyone has been waiting for him for so long. So naturally, the disciples are actually starting to get pretty excited about this. I mean, they're listening to Jesus. They're thinking, yes, it's about time. This is what we've been waiting for you to do, to judge the world. You're going to take back the throne, and you're going to judge all the wicked people on earth so that we can once again live in peace. But Jesus says, do you think that I've come to give peace on the earth? 
And the disciples are thinking, oh, yeah. I mean, don't you remember what the angels were singing when you were born? Peace on earth and goodwill toward men. Not to mention that one of your names, Jesus, by the way, is Prince of Peace. It's right there in Scripture. So, yeah, that's what we're expecting. Jesus says, no. I tell you, I came to bring division. Not just a division that we're okay with. Not just division between the Romans and the first century Palestinians. Not just division between Jews and Gentiles or Democrats and Republicans. The division that we understand and even like sometimes. He says, this will be a division between family members. This division will get into your house. Between fathers and sons. Mothers and daughters. Even your in-laws. Well, I guess the in-laws is a bit more believable, but... <laughs> this division will get right inside your family. You have to ask yourself at this point, what is Jesus' problem with families? This is not the first time Jesus has spoken so harshly against families. In Matthew, there's the story of Jesus' mother and his brothers they come looking for Jesus, and he basically ignores them and says to the crowd, or says to his disciples, look out at the rest of the disciples and the rest of the crowd. These are my mother and my brothers. These are my family. My family is anyone who does the will of my Father in heaven. He basically just ignores his immediate family. And that's not even so bad compared to a couple chapters after our text in Luke today. In Luke 14, Jesus says... If anyone comes to me and does not hate their own father and mother and spouse and children and brothers and sisters, they cannot be my disciple. There's a reason the focus on the family did not choose that verse as their slogan. <laughs> <laughs> what is Jesus saying? Jesus is not saying that your family is bad or unimportant. What Jesus is saying is that your family cannot save you. See, every one of us carries around a cherished version of what a family should be. Some of us look at what Jesus talks about in this division and we say, that's our family, it's divided, it's dysfunctional, and we long for this other ideal version we have in our heads precisely because we don't have it. Others of us look at what Jesus says and we say, thank God that that's not our family. We're not divided. We're, we're doing pretty great. And that sometimes scares us. Because what if something happens? What if our family doesn't stay that way? What if I can't keep it that way? And we have different names for whatever our ideal version of the family is. We can call it a biblical family or a traditional family. Or maybe we call our family a modern family. It doesn't really matter what name we use or, or what state our family is in. We all want basically the same thing out of family. We want it to be a loving and a safe environment. We want it to be the kind of family that's idealized in the TV shows from the 1950s. Family should be a place of predictability, of security, of peace. Kind of sanctuary from the harsh realities of life outside the home and outside the family. And so for many of us, creating this kind of family or protecting this kind of family becomes our highest mission and purpose in life. And so it makes sense that when we perceive a threat to our family or to our cherished version of family, we will fight tooth and nail to protect it. Again, even if our family doesn't live up to our ideal, we will still protect that ideal. Sometimes this works in surprising ways. A friend of ours in seminary grew up in a very poor family, inner city family, and her siblings uh, struggled through drug addiction and teen pregnancy and dysfunctional relationships. And so when this friend of ours decided that she was going to go to college and she was going to graduate and get a good job and she married an upstanding young man, you'd think that her family would have been happy for her. Instead, they ridiculed her. They said, who do you think you are? Do you think you're better than us? You're not. 
You're still part of this family. Stop pretending that you're different. See, even though she chose a better way of life, it was a way of life that was different than her family. Her brothers and sisters and her parents had a certain view of what it meant to be in their family, and she was rejecting them. We will always fight against threats to our version of family, even when our version is miserable. According to Jesus, the greatest threat to our family does not come from outside, outside influences, from our culture, our society. <clears throat> According to Jesus, the greatest threat comes from within when we start to expect more from our family than it can possibly provide. When we expect our family to fulfill all of our longings, our deepest desires, the longing for safety and love and meaning and purpose and happiness all the time, when we expect that of our family, we are expecting our family to be our savior. And that is a burden that no family can ever live up to. Your spouse will never fully know you or love you the way that only God can. Your children will not always avoid your mistakes. And they won't always marry the right people. And your parents, they will not always provide you with the constant love and support that you need, even if they want to and try to. I'm not telling you anything you don't know at this point. But a family that tries to be its own savior will constantly be disappointed and divided. The idealized version of a family will always destroy the real one. So what unites a family? I don't think Jesus was saying, I hate families, therefore I want them to be divided. He's just pointing out the fact that people are going to have to decide about whether to follow Jesus, and that's going to tear some families apart. He just knows this. But it doesn't mean he doesn't want families to be united. So what unites a family? The only thing that can unite a family is when Christ is at the center. Only when a family chooses to let Jesus be its only Savior can it break free from these unrealistic expectations and thrive. Now what does this look like? Well, for one thing, when you put Christ at the center of a family, Christ becomes the purpose and the mission of that family. Rather than the mission being just self-preservation, and kind of isolating yourselves into a safe family that's, that's separate from the rest of the world, Jesus gives the family a different mission. You see, God never intended families to be closed systems, cut off and protected from the rest of the world. From the very beginning, families were meant to be a vehicle for carrying the blessings of God to other people. This means that families are meant to be open systems. Families are meant to open themselves in, in love and kindness and hospitality, even to strangers in their midst. By the way, that includes the strangers in your own family. And maybe you woke up one morning and you looked at your spouse or you looked at your teenage child and you said, Who is this person? I don't remember them being this strange. <laughs> Or maybe you've finished raising your own kids, only to find that now you are raising someone else's kids. That's the mission of family. To create space in the family, space in the home for others to come in and experience the love and hospitality of God. Even though that sounds nice, it's not easy. Most of you can nod your heads, you already know this. You, you open your family to another family member, to a stranger, it's going to be costly. Just because Jesus calls a family to be a certain way doesn't mean he will go easy on them. But this is the mission that God gives to families. 
And it's only this mission that can actually hold a family together in the end. At weddings, I often tell couples that the best picture of a healthy marriage is not, you know, two young people standing there googly-eyed at each other and holding hands, staring into each other's eyes and oblivious to the rest of the world. That's not, at least in the long run, that's not a picture of a healthy marriage. The picture of a healthy marriage is one of two people standing side by side, facing in the exact same direction, and holding hands. Families hold together when they share a common mission that is beyond self-preservation, that is beyond themselves. Now, if you're starting to think that this mission sounds impossible for your family, or impossible for any family, that's because it probably is. Alone, your family cannot ever hope to fulfill this mission of perfectly opening itself up to every person in need that comes along. That's why Jesus gives us a bigger family, the family of faith. Everyone who has been baptized into Christ has been adopted into this family, into the same relationship that Jesus shares with His Heavenly Father and the Holy Spirit. We have been adopted into that relationship and into that family. So our immediate family is now part of God's family, this communion of saints which spans all of time and space. Therefore, the author of Hebrews says, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, pioneer and the perfecter of our faith. Put Jesus at the center. No matter what state your family is in today, no matter how divided or dysfunctional or small or large your family is, Jesus Christ is the only one who can save it. Jesus Christ is the only one who can give back to it its original mission and purpose. So fix your eyes on Jesus Christ, in whom all things hold together, including your family and the family of faith. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.